Thank you. It's a, a, a thrill for me to be here, and there are two particular reasons that it's a thrill. One is that uh, ni late 1980s, you already have a glimpse of this, there was this complete star at the University of Chicago, young star, no gray hair, but otherwise a lot, looking a lot like this guy. And uh, he was brilliant, and he was creative, and he was fearless. And uh, I got to be his colleague for a time, and uh, to see him here as a famous law professor, that's a, a thrill for me. Uh, also, uh, there are some Irish kind of Irish kind of people who are in the room, <laughs> and uh, I got to be married in Ireland, and uh, it's a joy for me really to be here, this amazing institution and this amazing city, and uh, to be able to thank my Irish American hosts. Um, so. Uh, so we're going to talk about some very concrete matters uh, in the near future, but I want to link them with some more abstract matters connected with Professor Griffin's early opening remarks. And that is uh, our system, which um, is a blessing for Americans and for the world, uh, was born in a very unusual period. That is a period in which uh, statesmen uh, were able, for a time, uh, to look in significant part above uh, partisan squabbles that divided them to kind of don uh, a veil of ignorance uh, that would enable them uh, to generate institutional arrangements that maybe could promote uh, freedom and prosperity and stability. Uh, under circumstances that could not possibly have been anticipated. Uh, we're not in a time that's as challenging as theirs in many respects, but we are in a time when there is a risk that short-term squabbling can deflect attention from strategies that could be associated, if things go well, uh, with prosperity and liberty and stability. And here by stability, I mean not only domestic, but also international stability. So insofar as these remarks are going to be concrete about something very particular, and you can see it on the slide, institutional flip-flops, uh, indulge me if you would and have in the back of your mind a thought about how the problem of institutional flip-flopping, I'm going to try to say it is a, uh, is a problem, how the solution to that problem might be connected with some of the oldest and most inspiring aspirations of our, our constitutional order. Okay, uh, there's a promise of some empirical work a few minutes ago, and we're going to redeem the promise now. Here's a survey un I undertook uh, very recently with my uh, co-author, Eric Posner. President Bush was often blocked by the Democratic Senate, which frequently refused to confirm his nominees. Frustrated by the intransigence of said Senate, he resorted to recess appointments, which bypass the Senate when it's out on what the president considered a Senate recess. Now, it might be worthwhile for you to think for yourself, to yourself for a moment how you'd answer the question. Do you think that President Bush did the right thing, bypassing the Senate? Okay, Republicans say yes, 58%. Democrats say no, 68%. So there is very strong Republican support for presidential bypassing under Bush and very strong democratic rejection, over two-thirds of President Bush. Okay, here's the second question in our empirical research. The empirical agenda is growing before your eyes. Same question with Obama as president. Republicans say no, 89%, whereas before they had said yes, 58%. Democrats say yes, 66% whereas before they had been overwhelmingly against. Just changing the name of the president flips people's judgments on a very serious institutional issue, that is recess appointments. Okay, there's a picture. You deserve a picture? <laughs> Guess what kind of shoe that is. Okay, second survey. In the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, this is true, 
President Bush was sometimes concerned that legislation enacted by Congress intruded on his constitutional authority in the area of national security. President Bush issued signing statements setting out his own views. Some of the statements said he would ignore congressional enactments that did, in his view, intrude on his authority. So the basic setup is clear. The President of the United States said, I'll sign the legislation, but I'm going to issue a signing statement reserving my constitutional rights. Do you approve? A lot of Republicans said yes, about 37 percent. Interestingly, less than a majority, and I'm going to say a little bit about why that's so in a moment. Democrats, much less enthusiastic, about 20 percent. That's to say there is almost double as much Republican support for the signing statement as the Democrat under President Bush. Same question for Obama. Republicans widely disapprove. Only 16 percent think it's okay. Democrats become upbeat, over two-thirds. The question is, why are the Republicans basically negative about Bush signing statements? Why is that? I don't know the answer, but I have two speculations. One is they don't like President Bush so much. <laughs> and the other is that they know they might get trapped if they say a yes answer into saying a similar yes answer for President Obama. So there's a kind of shadow effect of the presidency. Nonetheless, we are observing, again, that. Third survey, what about the Constitution? Do you support same-sex marriage? We asked a bunch of people. Do you believe that the Constitution permits Congress to ban same-sex marriage throughout the country? Now, before I get to the next slide, I have to tell you there's one slide in the bunch that has an error, and it's this one, but I'm going to correct it. Okay, ready for the erroneous slide and then the correction. Okay, the results are among supporters of same-sex marriage, only 10% thought Congress could ban. Cross out that not. That is to say, if you support same-sex marriage, you're overwhelmingly likely to think that Congress lacks the constitutional authority to ban. Okay? Among opponents of same-sex marriage, 49% thought Congress could ban. So if your view of the constitutional authority of Congress of the United States is importantly affected by what you think about same-sex marriage. If you like it, you think Congress can't ban it. If you don't like it, you think 50-50 whether Congress could ban. Okay, we're observing a flip-flop. Here's the third survey and the final one. Do you think the Constitution permits Congress to require all states to recognize same-sex same marriage? Kind of a complicated legal issue. I thought, by the way, if we're surveying ordinary people about a technical constitutional issue, they're not going to answer it or they're going to just be baffled. Not so. People have, people have strong convictions. Here's the stunning outcome. Supporters of same-sex marriage, 69%, almost two-thirds, almost three-quarters, said yes, Congress can require states to ban to recognize same-sex marriage. Opponents, only 6% said yes. So notice, if you would, we have basically three sets of questions. One involves approval of signing statements. One involves approval of recess appointments. And one involves a technical constitutional question about congressional power. And in all three, people's answers are importantly or even decisively determined by one thing, who's the current president? Is he a Democrat or a Republican? Okay, here are possible illustrations of flip-flopping, and I'm going to try to interrogate when we actually have one. For the filibuster, for recess appointments, for executive privilege, for executive actions such as immigration, it is just the case that the view of members of the Democratic and Republican Party are importantly affected by the political identity of the appointing president. I was myself, actually I blocked this out until this very moment, I was myself personally subject to a filibuster that did not motivate even unconsciously this paper, Dr. Freud. <laughs> Nonetheless, I was not filibustered by the Democrats. In fact, I had near unanimous Democratic support. It was the Republicans. 
Perhaps that was because they thought I shouldn't be in office, but perhaps it was affected by the political party of the appointing president. Issues with respect to the filibuster under Majority Leader Senator Reid were very partisan in the first Obama term, as you may recall. Senator Reid engineered filibuster reform that the Republicans adamantly resisted. When they gained the Senate, did they want to go back to the previous regime, or did that control of the Senate apparently affect their views of the filibuster? They basically ended up being okay with what Senator Reid had done. With respect to assertions of executive privilege throughout our history, when Republican presidents assert authority to ex exercise executive privilege, Republicans are okay with that, Democrats not so much, and it completely flips. Very recently, in areas that involve war powers, we've seen similar flipping. Bush against Gore, the big Supreme Court decision, involved an expansive use of the Equal Protection Clause on the part of conservative justices, not normally excited about expansive use of the Equal Protection Clause. Democratic justices, who sometimes like expansive use of the Equal Protection Clause, weren't so thrilled about it in that case. In cases involving federalism and preemption, we observe the following, I think, anomaly. That is, if it's an immigration case, and the question is whether a state gets to exercise authority over immigrants, or whether there's preemption by the federal government such that the state can't intervene, the liberal justices are excited about federal preemption of state authority. That's what we observe. The conservative justice is not so much. If the question involves the exercise of tort law, then we see a flipping. If tort law is being imposed to protect, let's say, injured persons, then the liberal justices and judges tend to be okay with state authority, and the conservative justices start to be more excited about preemption. If you were to go through the Supreme Court's ju justices' votes in preemption issues and just look at the kind of ideological valence of the question, you'd have a lot of predictive power about where justices come down on federal and state authority. We've observed with respect to judicial authority in general over the last maybe 70 years, a series of flip-flops with conservatives under uh, liberal judges in the Warren court era being very skeptical about judicial authority and uh, liberals being enthusiastic about it and there tends to be flipping in terms of judicial interest in, in an active judicial role when the occupants of the seats of the Supreme Court are uh, thought to be wrong just substantively on the merits. So I hope this is enough to give a flavor of the omnipresence in both judicial life and in executive legislative life of uh, flip-flopping as, as a fact of American political and legal life. Okay, here's a source of flip-flops that I'm going to suggest is um, central. Let's call it merits bias, and it's a species of motivated reasoning. We can associate this with what might be called naive flip-flopping. And by naive, what's meant is that it operates not as a tactical or strategic matter, but as a naive and sincere set of judgments about what the institutional arrangements must be if we're to be faithful to our heritage, some version of that. But there's actually a motivation in the background that those who are making the claims aren't quite alert to. Now there's a sports analogy here. If we're watching uh, Tulane, let's say, play against its principal adversary in a sport, and there's a referee, and the principal adversary's fans are watching at the same time, and then both Tulane fans and adversaries' fans are asked, was the referee biased after the game? It is thoroughly predictable that Tulane's fans will detect an anti-Tulane bias and that adversaries' ban fans will detect a pro-Tulane bias. Completely predictable. Now, I'm a Boston Red Sox fan, 
And it just is the case that the umpires are consistently biased against the Red Sox, <laughs> but that's unusual. Usually the, the umpires play it straight and the fans detect bias. Okay, motivated reasoning is that form of reasoning which could be demonstrated in the following way. If I had a tort case with a narrative and asked this half of the room to represent the plaintiff and start thinking about how to defend the plaintiff, and this half of the room to represent the defendant and start thinking about how to represent the defendant. And after 10 minutes, I ask this half of the room who's likely to win and who should win, and this half of the room who's likely to win and who should win. It's going to be merits bias. You all are going to be pro-defendant. You all are going to be pro-plaintiff. It's predictable. It kicks in almost immediately. Okay, the claim here is that institutional questions can be really hard, highly technical, and complex, and so they're overwhelmed often by short-term political assessments, but only when the underlying norm or law is unclear. So let's give an example. Ought it to be the case, then, with, with respect to presidential appointments, say for members of the cabinet or people right underneath the cabinet who are subject to Senate confirmation, ought it to be the case that the Senate takes a strong view to make sure that the people who have been selected by the president have reasonable points of view and are honest and would do a good job? Or ought it otherwise to be the case that the Senate basically rubber stamps the presidential's, president's choices unless they're palpably incompetent or corrupt? Those are two different views. Now, to figure out how to answer that question, I think we have to ask a series of other questions, such as how important is it for the president to get his own people in? What kind of delay actually compromises something that matters? If the president gets someone in whom the Senate has questions about, what kind of damage can that person actually do to our nation? And there's an assortment of other questions that has to be answered to figure it out. In the abstract, I think it's not easy to have a clear, simple intuition that a weak or strong view is the right one with respect to the filibuster. And given the hard and technical nature of that question, a short-term political assessment will dominate. Now, I think what makes this interesting, and the data with which I began revealing, is that for even people with a degree of professional expertise, like members of the United States Senate, to come up with a clear view about the filibuster in the abstract, that's hard. It's not easy. And so you might register a very immediate thought, of course, under President Obama, it's appropriate to exercise an aggressive role and not to be alert to the extent to which merits bias is actually dominating the institutional judgment. And I'm hoping this is resonating with you in the sense that all of us, I think, have been involved in institutional conversations in which an implicit understanding of our hopes or goals on the merits is actually dominating our institutional assessment. And if our merits, hopes, or goals cut the other way, we'd have the opposite institutional view, but we don't bother to ask that question. Okay, that's merits bias. Here's a second kind, tactical flip-flops. Tactical flip-flops we're going to describe a little bit harshly as cynical and opp opportunistic in the sense that they're not a reflection of a naive belief that the institutional judgment has nothing to do with merits. They are a result of a clear sense that to assert an institutional judgment is a way of getting at your preferred merits outcome, and you are using the institutional claim opportunistically. Now, this is, I think, so pervasive and so inevitable part of our political system that we don't want to be too hard on those who act strategically or tactically. But to get a sense of the idea, if you have a member of the Senate, let's say, a Democrat under Republican president, who is asserting that in a society dedicated to self-government, it must be the case that the Senate gets to be uh, fairly aggressive in deciding who the Attorney General is, it may be that that Democratic Senate is not acting kind of out of bounds. 
in asserting the institutional prerogative when in fact what it's trying to do is to make sure that the not beloved president doesn't get the, his person in. So this is just a suggestion that the emphasis on the institutional, the timeless institutional norm may in fact be purely a matter of rhetoric as a way of ensuring that the substantive goal is achieved. Now it's not never been the case that the Senate, to continue on the filibuster example, it's not never been the case that the Senate hasn't thought, if we don't allow the president to get his preferred people in, we will weaken the president's authority to implement his policies. That's not what's said. What's said is we get, as the entity that gets to advise and consent, to assert authority over the composition of the executive branch. That's an institutional claim. But the underlying goal isn't purely institutional, it's substantive. If we look at the incentives of political actors, the persistence of tactical flip-flops shouldn't be so much of a surprise. First and foremost, the political scientists say, it's too simple, but it's not wrong, political actors want to be reelected. And if a member of the Senate says, I'm going to be fine with presidential appointees, even though I'm a different political party member, because I think the president's prerogatives get to be respected, that's not likely to be the most popular position in a district, let's suppose, that despises the president. Insofar as a member of the president's own party says, I'm going to follow the president's lead because I think the president under our system gets that kind of institutional deference, that's going to be really popular if this is, let's say, a dominant, uh, this is a, the, the, the district likes the president, and the re-election um, motivation will naturally entail a degree of tactical or strategic flip-flopping. It's just going to fall out of electoral self-interest. Now, some people think, and it's undoubtedly sometimes true, that members of the Republican Party want as much as they want to be reelected, they want their own party to be powerful, and the Democrats exactly the same. And if what you want is a powerful party, you want it to be cohesive. And the interest in party authority and cohesiveness is going to engineer a high degree of flip-flopping. The judicial analog's a little subtler. And here the question is, why would we observe federal judges flip-flopping members of the Supreme Court flip-flopping when they don't have an electoral incentive or anything like powerful party authority as one of their goals? Why would judges flip-flop? Okay, here's, here's an example where I think we might observe it. In order to get a majority, you need five votes. A, a plurality of four may lose to five, and it won't have the authority of a majority. Suppose you have a group of justices, some of whom think that the reason one side should prevail is individual rights, and others of whom think the reason that side should prevail is for reasons of federalism. Let's suppose to make it crude, the liberal three think individual rights, individual rights, individual rights, and the conservative two say, think this is really a federalism issue. It may be that the liberal three will join an opinion that invokes a federalism ground, even though they are not deeply committed to it and are actually a little bit skeptical of it, because that's the only way to get the outcome that they prefer and to fracture the majority isn't worthwhile. In another case down the line, the liberal three, as we're saying, aren't going to press the federalism line with enthusiasm and that's suggesting they will be visible flip-floppers, not because of anything clearly illegitimate, but because they are acting as, what, uh, team members on a multi-member court. So within the judicial system, there is a degree of inevitable flip-flopping, which has a kind of tactical or strategic dimension in the form of signing on to opinions with which you might not fully agree in a way that will lead you to look inconsistent in some subsequent case, but it's okay because the reason you joined the opinion was 
the institutional dynamic and not full agreement. It's strategic, it's tactical, but it doesn't have the kind of uh, opportunistic or cynical quality that we sometimes observe in the political domain. Okay, third category of flip-flopping involves what we're going to call Bayesian learning. This draws from the notion of uh, updating from economics, which says that people uh, learn when they get new data, and they may flip given what they learn. So this is an effort to say that some forms of flip-flopping may be honorable because they reflect not naivete or merits bias and not uh, tactical or strategic behavior, but just you know more. So look, if you would, at the arc of views about presidential unilateralism over the last, let's say, 15 years. There's a set of people, probably some of them are in this room, who were deeply skeptical of presidential unilateralism at some time in the um, uh, n not forgotten past, <laughs> but who are good with presidential unilateralism now. Now, those of you who fall within that category might have fallen prey to merits bias, maybe like the current president more than his predecessor. But it's inevitable that some people in that group think, you know, we've learned something. Either in the domestic sphere or in the international sphere, there is an insistent need for quick, immediate action by the person who's best equipped to take it, whether the question involves the environment or immigration or national security threats. And given what we've learned in the relevant period, that form of otherwise unacceptable unilateralism kind of looks good. That's flip-flopping, no question about it, but it involves learning over time. If we look at the arc of views about judicial restraint, we can see a lot of flipping, both on the left and on the right, but some of it may reflect just simple learning. I'll tell you a, a personal story, since we talked about the University of Chicago early days. Uh, as a kid law professor, I, I wrote a paper that uh, said that uh, James Madison believed in a deliberative system that wasn't purely reactive to popular will. He wanted a measure of reflection and deliberation in government. And that in the modern era, the uh, federal judiciary can sometimes do exactly what Madison wants. It doesn't have the uh, accountability of the institutions Madison created, but it can inject some deliberation into American government that might otherwise be missing. A senior colleague of mine, a uh, very conservative colleague, said, said, you know, it's a fine argument, but people like you who think that aren't going to be thinking it so much when, as in is inevitable, the judiciary is going to be occupied by people like me. <laughs> <laughs> and that, he made, made a sociological observation, and he's completely right. Mm -hmm. It happened that after, you know, a few decades of judges who are completely like this guy, uh, people who are left of center aren't as excited about the exercise of judicial discretion as they once were. Now, one view is that they're engaged in something like merits bias, the flipping on the left I'm describing, but the most uh, sympathetic thing to say about them is that they have learned. They've just learned. They've learned something about the judiciary over time. Justice Frankfurter was not a learner in this respect. The great Justice Frankfurter was someone who was reared under a period of an aggressive conservative court and he never got over it. He was the great conservative on the liberal court. Is that a tribute to his integrity and honesty? On one view, yes. In the view of his many critics, he was not a Bayesian learner. I tend to think he was honorable and in showing integrity. Not everyone thinks that. Okay, uh, here's a contributor to the problem of flip-flopping. And I'm going to call it partyism and give you a little more data. So we're back in empirical land. That's a cartoon. That's not data. <laughs> okay. Uh, what would you think if someone in your close family married someone of the opposite political party? What would you think? 
It turns out that in the United States, the percentage of Republicans and Democrats who dislike the idea of marriage within the family has been growing very dramatically. In 1960, it appears people thought that was a crazy question. Do you be upset if someone married? <laughs> crazy question. In 1910, nearly 50% of Republicans would be displeased, upset, or unhappy if their child married a Democrat, and about a third of Democrats were similarly upset. That's a striking phenomenon of the intrusion of political hostility into uh, daily life. Here's something else that I have to explain a little bit. There's a test called the Implicit Association Test, which has basically been used to try to test for racial prejudice. And the question is, if you see a white face on the screen, how quickly do you associate that with a word like good? And if you see an African-American face on the screen, how quickly do you associate that with a word like good? It turns out that white people show non-trivial racial prejudice systematically in that implicit association test. Now, that doesn't necessarily map on to prejudice behavior, but it shows that there's uh, non-trivial prejudice out there. OK, disturbing and true. But that's not what I'm going to tell you about. What I'm going to tell you about is that when Democrats see Republican people who are characterized as Republicans, they show very high levels of implicit prejudice, not easily be associating the word good with that person. In fact, it's now the case, apparently, this is a little hard to read, but it's now the case that shows that implicit party prejudice is more dramatic and larger than implicit racial prejudice. Prejudice across party lines is beating prejudice across racial lines. OK, what about attitude to behavior? For scholarship applicants, members of both parties choose the in-party candidate 80% of the time. Larger effect than race. For college admissions, strong partisans select the weaker candidate on objective criteria 56% of the time if that person's in the right political party. In prioritizing kidney dialysis, there's a strong correlation between people's decisions and party match. OK, let me go back to the slide and say that uh, uh, along dimensions that you might think Republicans and Democrats would show strong antipathy to various types, Whatever characteristic you describe, there's a good chance that they're going to show stronger prejudice against people of the opposing political party. And notably, this has grown over time in the United States, as the first slide suggests, but not in the United Kingdom, a very similar country in many ways. We're not ex observing a growth in partyism in the United Kingdom among conservatives and labor. This is a distinctly American phenomenon. Okay, the sources of it are not yet clear, but I hope it's clear that there's going to be a pretty strong interaction between partyism, as I'm describing it, and institutional flip-flops. Okay, uh, not flip-flops. Justice Scalia wanted to strike down the Affordable Care Act. He wanted deference on on that, in that area, and he feels the same way on gay rights. But he's pretty strong on invoking judicial power to strike down affirmative action programs and to protect gun rights. So Justice Scalia is a strong proponent of judicial power in the two latter areas, and in some areas a proponent of judicial deference. So Obamacare and gay rights may be the simplest. Strike down Obamacare, Congress can do what it wants with respect to gay rights. Uh, Justice Kennedy is a strong protector of gay rights, wants to exercise judicial power aggressively, but has not been willing to say affirmative action is always unacceptable. Is this, this flip-flopping? Okay, what I want to suggest here 
is that the charge of hypocrisy in the political and legal domain is often unfair, and similarly the charge of flip-flopping. So to know whether there's flip-flopping, we need to know whether there's a principle to separate pe what people do at time one from what people do at time two. And if there is an appropriate principle, then there's no flip-flopping at all. So this is, I hope, an obvious point meant to suggest that when Justice Scalia votes to uphold the Defense of Marriage Act but strike down the Affordable Care Act, there's no necessary flip-flop because he has a principle of interpretation that justifies those disparate results. And when Justice Kennedy takes a very strong stand in favor of gay rights, not so strong in form of across-the-board rule against affirmative action, it's because he has a theory of constitutional meaning that generates those results. So the basic plea here is not so readily to resort to the flip-flopping objection when once we get a fine-grained sense of what the person actually cares about, what their theory of interpretation is, we may not have flip-flopping at all. So it's common in the popular domain and not uncommon in academia to hold up two judicial opinions together and to accuse the judge of hypocrisy or flip-flopping. I'm making a plea that we not indulge that objection too readily if it's the case that there's a principle, which Justice Scalia just about always has, which may not mean he's right, but which probably means he isn't flip-flopping. Nonetheless, it is the case that we observe in a wide array of areas merits bias, even within the judiciary itself. There's a principle some of you may know. I hope all of you know. You're going to in a moment. The Chevron principle, which means in the face of ambiguity, administrative agencies get to interpret the law so long as their interpretation is reasonable. Big deal principle. The Affordable Care Act is unclear. The executive branch gets to interpret it as it sees fit, so long as the interpretation is reasonable. Same with the Clean Air Act. Okay, if, if you look at judicial voting behavior, you can observe that the political uh, party of the president matters to the judge's deployment of the Chevron principle. That is, Republican appointees are generally more likely to accept interpretations by Republican administrations Democrats by Democratic administrations. That seems to be a flip-flop. Okay, here's an objection to the argument I've made so far. The objection is, maybe there aren't any flip-flops, really. Maybe the ultimate principle following from the previous slide is actually pretty refined, such that the principle that's operating suggests there isn't flip-flopping, it's just we need to specify the principle. So suppose you have the following principle. I am for signing statements if a Democratic president issues them. I am for a lot of filibusters if the president is really bad. If you believe either of those principles, then there is no flip-flop. And it might be that if you go through the cases with which I began, there's some principle that's describable in this way that makes someone not inconsistent, but just adhering to a principle that has some degree of partisanship or substance built into it. I think this objection to the argument I'm making is unconvincing. And the reason is that people never or rarely say such things. They make neutral sounding arguments, which suggests there's a social taboo on making statements of this kind because they seem too patently self-serving and indifferent to the well-functioning institutions. So I want to contend that yes, there are flip-flops, really, even if principles like this are in some sense in people's heads. Okay, solutions. Are flip-flops even a problem? I want to suggest yes, they are. First, in the sense that they produce unpredictive debates, which are very time consuming. And second, in the sense that they produce bad outcomes. Now, I'm going to give a contentious example uh, produced uh, in the aftermath of these slides and these remarks very recently. You probably know what I'm talking about. The recent letter involving the no negotiations with Iran. 
It defies belief, doesn't it, to think that under a Republican president, Republican members of Congress would produce a letter of that sort and write it for a foreign government. That's not imaginable. I hope, I hope it's not imaginable that Democratic senators would write such a letter under a Republican president. Whether or not that's true, there is palpable flip-flop in the sense that Republican representatives could not possibly write a letter of that sort under a president of their own party. Now, whatever you think of the Iran deal in particular, the notion that members of Congress are feeling free to write to members of a foreign country with whom we don't have a particularly friendly relationship to um, discourage them from entering into an agreement that the President of the United States believes in the national security interests of the United States, there's a problem with that. It may be literally a dangerous problem. It's certainly an institutional problem of a potentially enduring character. And whatever you think of that example, if it's the case that under, let's say, a Republican president in 2016, Democrats suddenly flip on all sorts of institutional issues and asserting very aggressive understandings of Senate authority against the president, arguments that they rejected under President Obama, bad outcomes are expectable. The ability to operate a government is compromised. In terms of getting toward solutions, I want to put a spotlight on a fact which I haven't mentioned yet, which is there are lots of areas where we don't observe flip-flops. You don't see President Obama saying now, I used to talk about the two-term presidency and its clarity, but I think I'm going to run a third time. You don't see members of the Senate on the Republican side saying, now that we're in control of the Senate, we aren't going to have basically equal representative, representation of Democrats and Republicans on committees, and we aren't going to say that Democrats don't get to ask questions in committee hearings. So you see respect for institutional practices insofar as they are written down in a way that everyone can agree on, or in the sense that they have a kind of pedigree of history that's unambiguous behind them. We don't see them there. That's a kind of uh, happy light, I think, on prospects for the future. Now, there are three obstacles to reducing them more, and we've seen them merits bias, electoral self-interest, and party loyalty. Okay, is there a remedy? Here's, I believe, the greatest political philosopher of the 20th century, John Rawls. I don't think this is quite a quote, but it's pretty close. The principles of justice are chosen behind a veil of ignorance. And Rawls's claim, with which many of you are undoubtedly familiar, is that the principles of justice are those principles which we would choose if we were behind a veil of ignorance and basically didn't know anything about ourselves and our particular situations. We didn't know whether we were going to be rich or poor, well-educated or not, where we were going to live, uh, didn't know male or female, we didn't know our skin color. What were the principles of justice we'd choose then? And there's a kind of nice story that Rawls believed what he said. He was off given many honorary degrees. He declined them all, saying, I don't deserve them, <laughs> which fits with his belief that behind the veil of ignorance, you know, he's not responsible for the fact that he turned out to be so smart. Kind of just got lucky. Okay. I don't know if he'd phrase it quite that way, but some version of that. Okay. So the question is, is it possible that we can generate a veil of ignorance that would permit us to get past flip-flops. To make this, and this is the last slide, so we're almost ready for questions. To make this work, we need to know what is it exactly that people are ignorant of, such that they are behind a veil of ignorance. They can't be ignorant of the fact that they live in a self-governing society. They can't be ignorant of the fact that there is a Senate, there is a House, there is a President. They can't be ignorant of the existence of judicial review. So I want to suggest that there's just one thing that the veil of ignorance makes them blind to, and that's whether they're in political power or not. That's the only thing they don't know. 
What kind of practice would they want with respect to the filibuster, executive privilege, war authority, constitutional issues, if they didn't know who was in the majority of the minority? That's a safeguard. Now, there are some obstacles to the power of the veil of ignorance. One obstacle is merits bias, which makes you think what's in your institutional self-interest is what you think is, is right. Another obstacle is short-term political interest, which can make the veil of ignorance pretty uncomfortable to wear. But if we look through American history, we can find countless domains in which something like a veil of ignorance has been effectively donned. Of course, in the framing period, uh, that happened. After the Civil War, a great deal was done behind the functional equivalent of a veil of ignorance, where people put their short-term political interest to one side. As recently, I think, as in what history will record as America's astonishingly successful response to the prospect of another depression, a lot of that happened because relevant actors were able to put themselves behind a veil of ignorance. Why does it work? It works because the political pressure from we the people is sufficiently insistent and strong that political actors feel embarrassed or um, unpatriotic in giving in to Barrett's bias. We're well over 200 years since the founding of the Constitution. Uh, Hamilton's dreams for the system that we could produce in Federalist Number 1, those dreams have been exceeded. And there's no better way, I think, for us to honor the founders' achievement than to try to put pressure on our elected representatives in the next period, the next decade, to reduce the problems, the many problems, introduced by institutional flip-flops. Thanks. Well, we've got a very nice reception for you shortly, but uh, Professor Sunstein did uh, agree to uh, take some questions if there were any. He was willing to do some Q&A. Sorry? Yes, hey, Nancy. So, uh, so the question's about judicial restraint. Uh, I think to know whether it should be discarded or not, we need to have a definition. And I'm completely with Judge Posner's definition, which is the judicial restraint means not invalidating things and uh, upholding things. Now, if you define judicial restraint as upholding things, then I think no sane person could think that judicial restraint is always a good idea. Right. If we had, you know, to take your pick of the most uh, palpable violation of the Constitution, judicial restraint would not be a good idea in the face of that. So the, a defensible account of judicial restraint would have to be something like this, which Judge Posner doesn't accept, which is that the court should not strike down legislation unless the violation of the Constitution is completely clear and unambiguous. That's a view that some people have hold, held throughout our history. I, th I don't agree with that position. I think it would have consequences that are too intrusive on our system of individual rights. Because the Constitution is so frequently unclear, does that mean X and Y and Z, all of which should be taken to violate the Constitution, are okay because the Constitution doesn't clearly forbid them? So I would not endorse the judicial restraint position in its sane form, but I think it is a worthy position and it's important that it be out there and it's coherent and it's not subject to flip-flopping or it shouldn't be if it's adhered to. So it's good that we have uh, in our legal culture an ideal of 
uh, judicial respect for the democratic process unless the violation of the Constitution is unambiguous. Judge uh, J. Harvey Wilkinson has defended that view, and I would not endorse it, but I think it's a nice cloud over the head of anyone who wants judicial power to be invoked when the Constitution doesn't clearly justify the invocation. I have two more questions. So your description of the problem is, is in large part basically psychological, so it's, it's kind of timeless. And then part of the description of the solution is based on these extraordinary uh, periods in American history. So it seems like it's historically kind of isolated. So why is the problem especially bad now? And why is now a good time for a solution? Okay, that's a great question. So you're right, there's a, there is a disconnect between my invoking the grand periods where institutional flip-flopping was countered by, by behind a veil and the, the more daily practices we're observing. I don't think I'd, I'd, I'd want to say, at least with uh, complete confidence, that the problem of flip-flopping is worse now than it was 20 years ago or 40 years ago. It's really bad now, but it might have been really bad 20 years ago and 40 years ago also. Um, th th there's, there's one thing that is unusual, at least in recent decades, which is the intensity of partyism. So, the, and that's, that's damaging. The United States has multiple problems. And if it's the case that the problems can't be solved through our legislature because both the Democrats, Democrats and Republicans say, if you're for it, I'm against it, uh, then we need some kind of solution. A, a veil of ignorance approach, uh, even for the not as grand as at the founding and crisis, complete crisis moments, a veil of ignorance approach, it, it, you can don a veil of ignorance. So I hope it's the case that the Iran letter is producing you know, some uh, internal soul searching on the part of uh, the Republicans and that the practices over the last few years would produce internal soul searching on the part of Democrats under a Republican president and uh, th that the feeling of embarrassment or being tactical or opportunistic or not faithful to the best understanding of our institutions, that's completely doable. M maybe I'm influenced on this by my own experience in government, so I'll say a little bit about that. Uh, the office I was privileged to head is, uh, thinks a lot about what are the human consequences of something involving airport safety or the environment or traffic safety or food safety. What, what are the effects? Meaning, is it going to make the food supply a lot safer so 20,000 people don't get sick? Or is it going to do very little so seven people don't get sick? And what are the costs going to be? And if you and the, the culture there under both Republican and Democratic presidents, I only saw one, but I'm told under both is you, know, you look at the human consequences and the the party stuff. You know, that's that's not relevant. So if Republicans think a rule is is bad or Democrats think it's bad, none of that matters. The question is what are the human consequences likely to be? And that institution created by President Reagan and followed by Democratic successors, it's kind of a veil of ignorance institution, which has gotten entrenched because of something that didn't involve the founding or the Civil War. But in a sense, we want institutions that, that work for people rather than are, that are just jumping around like jelly beans to short-term political goals. To build on your statement about partyism, if you need to be ignorant of whether you're in charge, it seems like the problem then is the two-party system at the heart of it. You have only two potential parties. One must always win, unless it's a 50-50 split in the oddity in the Senate. And so is the real issue that we need to dismantle the two-party system and create a multi-party system, or have no party system? And that may be an abstract or unworkable solution, but I wonder why that is not part of the solution. Well, it seems a little bold. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, okay, so I, I think the economic analysis of law has had one great idea and many good ideas. The, the one great idea is if you're ever stuck, think about how to reduce decision costs and error costs. And to move from uh, a, our current two-party system to some other, 
would have decision costs that are nearly infinite. They're certainly prohibitive. So uh, there's that practical obstacle. On the error side, the question is whether something other than the two-party system, even if feasible, would be better. And uh, to hold so much of the world constant to make that assessment is really hard. Right. It'd be, so I don't have a, the reason it's not on the table is I don't have a particular beef with the two-party system. And uh, in many periods in American history, it's, it's served us spectacularly well. So the question is whether the, the less ambitious question than yours, uh, the decision cost lower question than yours, is what can we do to, to help our existing system solve problems within the context of a two-party arrangement? Point out, Professor Sunstein's going to be here for the whole reception, and we have a very nice one for you in the NPR. And so he's perfectly happy to answer your questions individually. But I just thought we should thank him one more time.